Uh, yeah, I hope everyone can uh, hear me okay, and um, I hope everyone is uh, doing well in their own way. So my uh, aim in this uh, talk is to really tell you about a, a smattering of topics that I've been interested in the past uh, few months or so, and they're all sort of uh, unified by this idea of using small-scale structure, or in other words, the lowest mass galaxies and the lowest mass dark matter halos to learn something um, about you know the fundamentals underlying our cosmological model. So uh, let's see. So this is going to be the outline of my talk. So I want to start by giving a little bit of a historical prelude into how dark matter halos have become sort of a widespread um, you know subject in cosmology. And then the main bulk of my talk will be split into three components, where I'll start by talking about the smallest dark matter halos that are expected to actually host galaxies in them, these things called ultrafaint dwarf galaxies, and how one might use ultrafaint dwarf galaxies to learn something about the assembly history of our own galaxy. I'll then talk about a slightly smaller mass scale of dark matter halos now, which do not contain galaxies in their own right, but this turns out to be something of a sweet spot for constraining many models of dark matter. And finally, I want to tell you about uh, some more recent work that I've been involved in, which now really pushes uh, numerical simulations into a very different regime, uh, which is in resolving the very limits of structure formation in a cold dark matter universe, where the dark matter halos now are comparable in mass to uh, that of the Earth itself. Um, okay, so to start with a little bit of history. Um, so dark matter halos as we know them probably owe their origins to um, you know, the early measurements of galaxy redshifts in the Coma Cluster by Zwicky. And even in his 1933 paper, you can already see the mention of the word dark matter uh, being prominent. And this is something I guess many people will know of. Um, sorry, so, you know, sorry, Sonak, I, I see your slides. Something, I mean, I see something weird. So I was just want to double check if people can see your slides or it's on your microphone, probably. Okay. Uh, does anyone, does everyone see uh, normal slides or are you... yeah i don't really see them that well either I, uh, I can see the slide but it's over magnified okay yes yeah. that's what i see too mm -hmm. so over magnified in what sense uh it's uh i see like pieces of different slides merged together and they're like yeah it's 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 very weird can you maybe uh uh restart the slideshow uh sure yeah Let's see. Um, maybe it's a problem with the, uh, the f external desktop that is connected some, uh, yeah, at the same time. So, so do you still see the weird thing? Um, no, I see I see the normal slide, but can you can you switch to a different slide now? Uh, okay, different slide. Uh, yeah, it looks normal to me. Yeah. What, what about others? Yeah, yes, this looks normal. Okay, right. great. Yeah, sorry for cool. that. No, that's okay. Thank you for notifying me. Okay, so what was I saying? So yeah. So, uh, so in the 1933 paper, there's a particular paragraph where Zwicky sort of exclaims his astonishment at finding that you know, if you use the motions of these nine galaxies in the coma system to infer the mass of coma, you infer something that is around uh, a factor of 400 greater than the mass that you would estimate based on the luminous material itself. And so he comes to this startling conclusion, as he says, of there being a large amount of dark matter that perhaps far exceeds the luminous material within the galaxy itself. And so that really is our first, uh, I suppose, inklings towards the idea of a dark matter halo. And then towards the sort of 60s and 70s, I suppose, the idea of dark matter became, um, or dark matter halos became much more mainstream. And, uh, not only just uh, using the idea of galaxy motions in clusters, but through a variety of different techniques. So on the left-hand panel, you can see there's a compilation of data using a variety of different methods using uh, 
say, variable arguments or the timing argument or even galaxy uh, rotation curves, which are estimates of essentially the mass profile of uh, giant spiral galaxies. And what you basically note here in this work by our striker Peebles and Yahil is that this mass profile sort of increases linearly with distance, uh, going out even to a megaparsec and greater. And this is far beyond where, you know, the Andromeda Nebula actually is itself. And so the fact that the mass profile exceeds well beyond the luminous material um, through a number of different uh, um, uh, sort of measurements uh, became, uh, I think, something uh, quite noteworthy. Of course, the uh, most familiar sort of um, motivation for dark matter comes from the perspective of galaxy rotation curves. And what's interesting to note in this compilation that you see uh, on the right hand side um, is that even going as far back as 1958 or so, uh, there are measurements of rotation curves uh, of Andromeda using 21 centimeter observations that already point towards uh, a sort of flat rotation curve going out to the very exteriors of galaxies uh, beyond what might be expected with an exponential disk. And of course, these data were then solidified uh, with the works of Rubin and Ford, Roberts and Whitehurst, and so on and so forth. Now, the CFA played a very prominent role in actually establishing this idea of dark matter uh, being a sort of vital component for structure formation. And really, this uh, the synthesis of using uh, theoretical work and combining it with data to establish this idea of dark matter or cold dark matter um, became possible uh, after it became possible to actually compute initial conditions uh, from inflation for what a universe made of dark matter might look like. So here's a set of uh, numerical simulations by Davis et al, where you see in the top two panels, these are the predicted distribution of galaxies in two variants of a cold dark matter universe. So cold in this case, meaning that the dark matter particles don't uh, sort of uh, have any relativistic motions in the early universe. And if you compare that with the then known observed distribution of galaxies from the CFA redshift survey, you find it's a pretty good match both visually and even in a quantitative sense if you were to compute a clustering. And this sort of comparison also became one of the ways by which early uh, models for the dark matter, such as these hot dark matter or neutrino dark matter universes, uh, became uh, you know, something that you could rule out. And one of the great uh, powers of, uh, I suppose, um, the dark matter paradigm is that numerical simulations have allowed us to make um, predictions of what structure formation uh, might look like on highly nonlinear scales. So this is now showing the distribution of dark matter halos and subhalos around the galaxy that might look something like the Milky Way itself, taken from the Aquarius project. And one of the fundamental things that is predicted in the dark matter model is basically the abundance of these low mass dark matter halos that should surround every massive galaxy. So quantifying the abundance of these substructures becomes one of the most, uh, I suppose, definitive predictions after assuming a particular dark matter model. And one of the primary uh, sorts of predictions that n-body simulations of all kinds have really made um, has come in the form of the internal structure of the dark matter halos that we actually see, uh, which is now most familiarly known as the so-called NFW profile. So this is a diagram taken from the work by Navarro, Frank, and White in 1996, where you see the density profile of the dark matter halos of spanning a wide range in mass, going from dwarf galaxies to rich clusters. And you see that the results from the simulations themselves, because of these jagged white curves, are fit very smoothly by these solid white lines, which are all the descriptions of this two-parameter model called the NFW profile. And the characteristics of this profile is that the central uh, or the uh, innermost part of this profile rises steeply as minus one. It goes to minus two in the middle and even uh, more steep uh, in the outskirts, going uh, decreasing as uh, r to the power of minus three. And the sort of unique feature of this um, density profile of the internal structures of dark matter halos is that if you were to rescale the units on the x and y axis in some appropriate way, which basically takes out the mass of the object in question, all of these curves would essentially collapse onto one uh, single curve, basically saying that across wide ranges of mass, uh, you get pretty self-similar and universal profiles. Okay. So what is the uh, spectrum of objects you actually expect to form in a given cosmological model? 
Uh, well, the answer to that question actually depends on what you assume to be the model itself. Um, so here's a rather a nice uh, diagram made by Stucker et al, which uh, essentially shows you uh, the initial power spectrum, um, or in other words, a measurement of the lumpiness of the universe at early times, uh, as predicted for different uh, choices of what the dark matter could be. So you notice that uh, so small scales go to the right and large scales are on the left. And so if your dark matter is something like a warm dark matter particle rather than a cold particle, these, uh, these uh, particles have you know, rest masses which are of the order of a few kilo electron volts. And the free streaming motion of these particles can essentially generate a cutoff in the power spectrum, which basically smooths out structure formation on some particular scale. And for reasonable choices of the mass of the particle, this scale is of the order of dwarf galaxies. So around 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 10 solar masses and dark matter. On the other hand, for say, uh, typical choices of a cold dark matter particle, say a weakly interacting massive particle of a mass of 100 GeV or so, this cutoff occurs on much, much smaller scales where in fact the smallest things that form are of the mass of the Earth. And if you were to then consider an even more exotic scenario of something like a micro EV axion, this cutoff occurs on much, much smaller scales. So one other way to visualize uh, this is by actually making a sort of a simple uh, illustration of what you might think are the whole span of objects you would expect to form in terms of uh, dark matter halos in a given model. So here I've assumed that the dark matter is something like a, a familiar cold uh, dark matter particle, a, a sort of wimp-like particle. And in that case, the smallest objects you expect to form are these 10 to the minus six solar mass, earth mass dark matter halos, uh, going all the way up to the rich clusters of the mass of 10 to the 15 or so. And so in this talk, I want to focus on three specific regimes. Uh, in the first case, I'll focus on this regime between around 10 to the eight and 10 to the 10 solar masses. Uh, which I call the edge of galaxy formation, because this is roughly around where dark matter halos actually stop being able to uh, collect gas and form galaxies. I'll then move very briefly onto a somewhat smaller regime from 10 to the 6 and greater, which happens to be the sweet spot where testing theories of dark matter becomes interesting. And finally, I'll go into the much more exotic limit of going all the way down to the Earth mass halos, the very edge of structure formation itself, and tell you about how some of the fundamentals of what we thought about dark matter halos uh, actually may or may not change uh, in this very unique regime. So to start with the case of these dwarf galaxies, I suppose one of the most prominent uh, and exciting, I suppose, um, uh, sort of comparisons between the theory and data has come about in the form of this so-called missing satellites problem where the familiar thing goes that if you were to again look at the image of uh, the dark matter surrounding the Milky Way, you see hundreds of thousands of subhalos as predicted by the cold dark matter model, uh, which is in stark contrast to the relatively few satellite galaxies we've actually observed in the data, uh, which, are, which are of the order of 50 or 55 or so. And even if you were to, com uh, to correct these uh, observed numbers for the completeness of these surveys, they reach nowhere near the hundreds of thousands uh, predicted by the cold dark matter model. So if our idea of structure formation is correct, why is it that most of these uh, halos remain dark? And well, the idea, uh, the answer quite simply is that, well, not all dark matter halos are luminous. So this is uh, exemplified quite nicely in this uh, recent paper by Benitez Lambe and Frank. And basically what this uh, cartoon shows is the mass growth of dark matter halos on the y-axis and time or redshift on the x-axis. So typical, uh, so I hope people can see my cursor, but typical lambda CDM halos, which end up with the final day mass of around 10 to the 9.5 or so are shown with this solid curve in the middle. And now, you've, now uh, these authors essentially take two uh, representative cases, one of a, of a dark matter halo that ends up with the galaxy, a luminous halo, whose mass accretion history is shown with this thin uh, curve going upwards, and another object which ends up with the same final day mass but has no stars in it. And the reason why one has galaxies and one doesn't is essentially because what determines the ability of a dark matter halo to actually collect stars is how deep its potential well is and whether it is able to actually trap gas from the intergalactic medium and form stars. So prior to reionization in the universe, the requirement is that the dark matter halos need to have a virial temperature which exceeds at least 7,000 Kelvin, which is around about what you need to ionize hydrogen. 
in order to form stars. But then after reionization takes place, the temperature of the intergalactic medium reaches somewhere on 20,000 Kelvin. And so the only dark matter halos that can actually host a galaxy are those which have a mass accretion history that crosses over this critical mass threshold, i.e. objects which have these real temperatures of around 20,000 Kelvin or so. And only these objects are the ones that are able to form stars. So the luminous halo is one which has essentially been able to cross this critical threshold at a couple of points in its history, whereas the star-free and dark matter halo is one which never manages to do that. And so this is one of the reasons why, even though our image of the local group, say, in dark matter looks something like this, the image of the local group in terms of its visible material looks something closer to that. It's only the really massive ones or only a subset of the smaller ones that actually form stars. So the question I've been particularly interested in is to actually take the uh, really low mass dark matter halos of the low mass dark matter halos that can host galaxies, these ultra faint dwarf galaxies, and see how the statistics of their population can actually tell us something about the diversity of the host dark matter halo, i.e. something like the dark matter halo of the Milky Way itself, and tell us something about the growth history of the Milky Way. Now, this is something that's become increasingly interesting in the past few years, thanks to Gaia, uh, and one of the things we found out uh, through Gaia is that um, the early history of the Milky Way is, is sort of punctuated by the accretion of a you know, relatively massive object with an informed mass of around 10 to the 11 solar masses or so that was accreted somewhere between 8 and 10 billion years ago. So the question I was interested in was to take uh, models of galaxy formation in a semi-analytic way and see whether if you were to look for these kinds of accretion events in a lambda CDM cosmology, whether this would tell you something about their ultrafaint populations at the final day. So this uh, diagram here is basically trying to exemplify that sort of an investigation. So what's shown here is redshift on the x-axis and the y-axis is the mass growth of dark matter halos, um, which end up with a dark matter mass comparable to that of the Milky Way. Uh, the y-axis is normalized to the present day mass. And all these dark matter halos end up with the same final day mass, but I've just split this population into two kinds. Um, one population which forms relatively early and one population which forms relatively late. So the only difference is their formation history rather than their final day mass. So then I see what their satellite populations at redshift zero actually looks like. And that corresponding diagram is shown on the left. So this diagram is a measure of the luminosity function of satellites, so the number of satellites as a function of their brightness, which is on the low uh, axis, or their stellar mass is on the upper axis. And what you find, so the colors correspond to the same color scheme as on the right-hand side. So firstly, focusing on the regime of these classical satellites, which have masses of, say, around 10 to the uh, 6 and greater, probably 10, yeah, around 10 to 6 and greater, uh, you find that there's no obvious uh, difference between what's happening in the orange and blue histogram. So the abundance of these populations is not hugely affected by the assembly history. But as you start looking into this regime of the ultrafane galaxies, uh, you find there is quite a stark contrast. And in particular, we find that the early forming host halos or Milky Way-like galaxies that form early are the ones that are more likely to contain a greater number of ultrafane galaxies. And this is simply because they end up experiencing many more mergers as a result of actually collapsing early. But you can actually do one better than that in numerical simulations because you don't just have to do something on the basis of uh, average populations, but you can actually start selecting on specific moments in the accretion history, specific types of accretion events that would be representative of our galaxy. So what I'm doing here now is taking all the dark matter halos which end up with a mass of around 10 to the 12 solar masses or so, which would be appropriate for a Milky Way, which gives us around 400 objects. And now each of these objects is represented with a single diamond, as you see in this uh, panel. The x-axis shows the formation redshift of this host halo. Um, and the y-axis is the number of ultrafanes contained within this halo, normalized to the average number of ultrafanes within this entire mass range. So in this first panel, I have specially highlighted in orange the subset of all Milky Way-like dark matter halos that have experienced and contain an LMC mass satellite at final day. So you find that this firstly limits you to just about 9% of the population, 
Uh, but the other thing that you find is that there's still a roughly equal split between the diamonds above and below the one-to-one -one line, which basically says that, you know, just selecting on dark matter halos that have had an accretion event similar to that of the LMC doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to be either overabundant or, or under deficient, I suppose, in terms of your ultrafane populations. So what about this early accretion event that we spoke about um, that was discovered in Gaia, this thing known as the so-called Gaia Enceladus? This turns out to be a rather more frequent occurrence for lambda CDM halos of a Milky Way mass. And in fact, around one in three objects, at least in the context of our galaxy formation model, seem to exhibit something similar. And around 56% of these uh, objects that have experienced this Gaia Enceladus-like accretion event are above the one-to-one -one line, saying that they are maybe slightly more likely to contain ultrafanes than the average galaxy of that mass. But what's quite interesting is that if you then select on uh, the subset of dark matter halos that have experienced both types of scenarios, which would be akin to that of the Milky Way uh, that we live in, you see that this reduces the parameter space of possibilities down to just 3%. So really, it's firstly pointing us to the fact that the exact kinds of accretion events that has been characterized as being the case for the Milky Way are really quite unique in nature. You don't find them that often in the lambda CDM cosmology. And the other interesting thing is that seven out of 10 of these points are actually above the one-to-one -one line, which basically kind of says, um, that you know, you're more likely to contain a larger number of ultrafanes than the average galaxy of your mass if you have experienced both types of events. And it's likely this ancient event, this Enceladus-like event, that is dragging in a larger number of ultrafanes. So that's interesting, but what about where you might be able to actually find one of these ultrafane galaxies? So this is a diagram which basically gives a census of the number of satellites as a function of their brightness, but now split into radial shells, where orange, the orange histogram basically shows you the census within 50 kiloparsecs, magenta between 50 and 100, and the teal between around 100 and the viral radius. And the most you know, obvious conclusion you can draw from this is that the vast majority of these ultrafane galaxies are concentrated pretty centrally. So within this inner 50 kiloparsecs or so, which has the you know, most prominent spike in terms of the histogram. Now, one rather important thing that we find from this investigation is that a sizable proportion of these ultrafanes, around 70% of them or so, are identified as what are known as orphan galaxies. So this is a nomenclature used in simulations to describe um, galaxies whose dark matter halos have been disrupted below the resolution limit of the simulation. Um, so that's just a numerical limitation. But we are still able to track them because we know that the galaxy has formed, so we can still kind of trace where the galaxy is going, even though the subhalo has been disrupted. Now, this might you know, sound like a bit of uh, numerical jargon and not of that much interest in its own right, but actually this has a very profound implication. Uh, for understanding something known as uh, the galaxy halo connection. So to motivate this, I want to show you this diagram here, um, which is uh, from work done by Grouse et al., uh, which basically shows the number of satellite galaxies um, that are found within the inner 100 kiloparsecs and sets of simulations that they have run. And the white histogram is basically the observed data from SDSS and the Dark Energy Survey. And in the simulations done by these authors, they find that the presence of the central galaxy disk, so the disk of the Milky Way, actually destroys a very large number of satellite galaxies. So if you were to just uh, populate galaxies within low mass dark matter halos according to the standard prescription of how you think reionization works, you would get this green curve, which you see completely misses the observed histogram uh, quite dramatically. And so these authors say that the only way by which you can match the data is by actually populating in very, very low mass dark matter halos, well beyond this edge of galaxy formation that I spoke about. So these are dark matter halos with masses of around 10 to the 7 solar masses or so. And you need to actually put galaxies into these really tiny entities in order to match the data. So what this means is that if you were to actually then look at what is the fraction of dark matter halos of a given mass that actually hosts a galaxy, whereas the standard reionization prescription, which is shown in this yellow curve, so the x-axis is something called peak circular velocity, which is just a proxy for halo mass, uh, 
the standard realization prescription that people have always really thought of and that you can compute from theory would suggest that no dark matter halos with circular velocities of around 15 kilometers per second and lower should host a galaxy. These authors claim is that in order to actually match these data because of the disruption by the central disk, you need to actually get something closer to this yellow curve on the right hand side. So you need to populate pretty much every dark matter halo going up to the very smallest objects. So we were interested in uh, the same question uh, to see how this uh, manifests in our simulation. And so the thing to, uh, that I want to stress first is that in the work done uh, previously, there was no ability to track these orphan galaxies in their simulations. But let's see what um, missing those entities or not as the case may be actually has, uh, what effect that has. So in this example here, I'm making exactly the same kind of diagram. So it's a number of satellites within some radius. The, observed, uh, the observations are shown in the white histograms again. Um, and if you were to apply a disk destruction model um, akin to that of the authors that I just demonstrated, you find this cyan shaded curve with no orphans. And exactly as they uh, suggested, you completely miss the data. So you have far too few because of the significance of the disk destruction. However, because we can now track these orphan galaxies, we can see what happens if you do include these orphans, which would have been disrupted below the resolution limits of their simulations, but we can still track them. And once you do that, you actually find that there is no significant inconsistency at all. And in fact, perhaps coincidentally, um, the, the radial profile that you get after correcting for these effects goes quite neatly through the data. And in fact, it's even worse than this, because if you look at different generations of hydrodynamical simulations, they all suggest uh, somewhat different levels of disk destruction. And so you can actually exceed even the observed counts, which I should stress here has not been corrected for incompleteness and so on. But what this basically shows is that you can get these order of magnitude differences uh, based on whether or not you choose to track these sub-resolution components. And so these ultrafine galaxies, which are very important for understanding how this galaxy halo connection actually works on these low, low mass scales, um, one has to sometimes approach these with a great deal of caution and perhaps uh, ex exhibit a, a bit of uh, maybe humility when it comes to um, trusting the, uh, you know, the limits of your simulation. So that's enough about galaxies that we can see. What about uh, looking at dark matter halos that uh, don't actually host a galaxy um, in them at all? So this is where really, I think, tests of dark matter become particularly prominent. So just to um, uh, reiterate the scale of interest, so we were looking at this regime of 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 10 in terms of the edge of galaxy formation. The sweet spot for testing dark matter turns out to be somewhere around here, which is dark matter halos of masses around 10 to the 6 and greater. And the reason why it comes into this range is kind of explained quite nicely in this diagram here. So this is a diagram which shows you the halo mass function or the number density of dark matter halos for a given mass interval with the mass on the x-axis uh, shown for a ver variety of different dark matter models. Uh, so you have cold dark matter shown in the white curve, so you have a large number of very low mass objects. And the different colored curves are essentially these variants of a warm dark matter like model with different rest masses. And obviously the warmer the model is, the more free streaming motions you get in the early universe and therefore you can deplete structures of more massive uh, halos. Now in, in these sequence of curves, I've highlighted the ones which are still viable models, these three and 10 KEV lines. And you see that the points at which they become uh, sort of dramatically different from the cold dark matter curve um, is essentially the point where um, at around mass scale of around 10 to the 9 solar masses or so. So getting really to the limits of where you would actually expect to form uh, galaxies within the dark matter halo. And so this is the reason why we have to sort of resort to looking at dark matter halos or probes of dark matter halos in the region where galaxies don't form in order to test these kinds of viable theories of dark matter. There's many other variations of dark matter that could take place, but I'm just focusing on the simplest case for now. So if you were to run a simulation of what you think, say, the Milky Way might look like, if you were to look at it in terms of the dark matter, it's really quite obvious um, that there is a difference between what's happening in cold dark matter and what's happening in warm dark matter. Admittedly, this is a rather exaggerated warm dark matter scenario. So the question is, you know, 
can we actually find a way to image the abundance of these low mass dark matter structures in and around uh, more massive galaxies uh, in order to um, actually be able to set some constraints on the nature of dark matter. And that turns out to be quite a useful technique where you can actually image these invisible halos, uh, which is thanks to this phenomenon of gravitational lensing, which is uh, demonstrated quite nicely in this uh, video. So the idea is that if you have a background galaxy, which is sending out its light uh, towards us uh, on the ground, as it encounters a foreground galaxy, the light is of course lensed uh, around this foreground and what we see is the image of the background galaxy just stretched as an arc or the Einstein ring um, on the image plane. And so the idea is that if we live in a universe which has a large number of you know floating dark matter halos in them, uh, which may or may not carry any galaxies in their own right, as one of these dark matter halos then intersects our line of sight, you would expect that this smooth Einstein ring or relatively smooth Einstein ring should be perturbed in some way uh, and cause a distortion in the surface brightness. And indeed, this is uh, what is seen. So here is uh, some data taken by Vegetti and Kochmans. And um, what you see here is a, a real Einstein ring where the contribution of the central galaxy has been subtracted. And at the top, you see, you see the sort of over density or a sort of a lump in the surface brightness distribution, which when you compare with a smooth model for the lens, you can actually infer as being caused by some kind of over density or perturbation, which could potentially be due to a dark matter halo. And if you find that this perturbation is caused by very low mass dark matter halos, then that could quite significantly constrain models of dark matter like warm dark matter, where you expect to find very few low mass dark matter halos. So the kind of experiment that we considered was to essentially do kind of mock simulations of warm dark matter universes and cold dark matter universes to see what this might look like. And to cut a long story short, we essentially found that, you know, this sort of strong gravitational lensing in this regime of 10 to the seven and 10 to the six solar mass dark matter halos turns out to be a very powerful tool to actually constrain um, warm dark matter like cosmologies, or in other words, cosmologies where the abundance of substructures is um, reduced. Um, and in fact, the hope is that with very uh, long baseline interferometry, you can actually detect even lower mass uh, dark matter halos in your strong lensing observations at the scale of 10 to the six solar masses or so, which really would be quite a powerful way to constrain the dark matter. Um, and you know, this, this particular exercise is by no means done just by us, as a number of different authors have listed down here and um, at, at, in the physics department at Harvard, there's also uh, Cora Dworkin's uh, group that has done a large amount of work on constraining the power spectrum of these kinds of effects. It turns out to be yet another way to um, detect uh, low mass uh, substructures um, in uh, the realms of uh, dark matter halos that may or may not contain uh, galaxies. And this is uh, through the uh, use of tidal streams to actually detect low mass perturbers. Um, and so this is shown quite nicely uh, in the work uh, done by everyone's uh, favorite uh, stream detective, Anna Bonazza here. Um, so this is a, uh, a stream uh, observed in the Milky Way, or the so-called GD1 stream. And you know, the, the idea is that the stream has been left over through the tidal destruction of a globular cluster. And as it's been ripped apart by tides in the Milky Way, you, you, know, you get this sort of stretched uh, sort of uh, tidal stream that is created. But we see that there's clearly perturbations in this observed stream, which is shown in the upper panel. Um, and you can especially see a sort of, you know, a couple of gaps and you can see a spur has been created there. And the idea is that this uh, perturbation might be created with an encounter with some kind of low mass object. And so in the work that Anna did, you can actually uh, recreate a model of this kind of an encounter um, with um, some numerical uh, interactions. And in Anna's work, she found um, that in fact, you could recreate exactly these uh, features within a model of uh, the GD1 stream if you have an encounter between the stream and a low mass perturber of a mass of around uh, 5 million solar masses or so. So this would be very exciting because a, a, a structure, if it were to be a dark matter halo of the mass of around 5 million solar masses is not something you typically expect to find in a cosmology like uh, warm dark matter or other dark matter models where low mass substructures are wiped out. 
So if this truly turns out to be due to interactions with a low mass substructure, then this really would be a very, very powerful way to set some constraint on the dark matter mass. The problem, however, is that the other property that this perturber seemingly has is that it should have been really quite compact with a characteristic uh, radial scale of around 10 parsecs or so. And why this is interesting is that if you were to work out what you know, the, the typical density of an object of this mass and that size would correspond to, it turns out that even within a cold dark matter model, you would struggle to find an object that has this level of um, this kind of compactness for objects of around 5 million solar masses, so by a factor of 10 or so. And so if this truly turns out to be a dark matter halo, which uh, may be the case or may not be the case, who knows? I know we'll probably know the answer better than I will. Um, then this might be interesting, not only from the perspective of uh, alternative dark matter models, but even in the context of uh, the cold dark matter scenario itself. So, uh, so, so now we've basically slid away from the smallest galaxies that we observe to lower mass dark matter halos that we can just about measure with um, you know, indirect uh, techniques like gravitational lensing or with tidal streams. What I want to uh, focus on for the remaining time in my talk is the scale that is far, far lower than any of this, um, which really pushes us into the regime of really the lowest mass dark matter halos one would ever expect to form in a cosmological model like whole dark matter. And so we really want to fill in this gap uh, spanning between 10 to the minus 6 solar masses and 10 to the 6 solar masses, so of almost 12 orders of magnitude, and establish what the structure of these first dark matter halos, or these earth mass halos, in other, wo in other words, uh, might actually look like. So we're now uh, looking in towards the edge of structure formation itself. Um, so you might ask, well, you know, why is that interesting if, you know, these are these incredibly tiny objects? Is there any hope of actually seeing them or measuring them, or do they have any impact in our lives at all? Well, one potential way by which you might uh, detect the uh, impact of these low mass dark matter halos is actually through the annihilation of dark matter. So in the study of dark matter annihilation, the expected flux you get from the annihilation of dark matter is some uh, convolution of uh, particle physics terms that include things like the cross-section for annihilation, the mass of the WIMP itself, uh, the branching ratio, and so on and so forth. Uh, but from the cosmology point of view, what uh, plays a, a, a key role, really, is the second term, which basically quantifies uh, the density squared along the line of sight. So this is the amount of dark matter that you see between you and you know, where you're trying to observe this, uh, this annihilation signal. And so obviously, because it depends on the density squared, it means that um, this particular term in this equation depends quite strongly on both the abundance of dark matter halos within, say, the halo of the Milky Way, if that's where you're measuring the annihilation signal, but also what the internal structure of these objects is. So in this particular project that uh, we've uh, just completed uh, recently, it's this second term that we're especially interested in. So what might something like this actually look like within the Milky Way itself? So here's a rather nice illustration in a sequence of annihilation maps created from the Aquarius simulation. So what's shown on um, each of these panels is the total annihilation luminosity that comes from different components of dark matter within the Milky Way. So on the top left, you firstly see just the contribution to the total annihilation luminosity from the smooth halo of the Milky Way. Okay, so this is just the central halo itself. And you see that because um, you know, the Milky Way's uh, density profile that is described by an NFW profile with, or something like an NFW profile, which has a steep cusp in the center. The bulk of the annihilation luminosity comes from the inner parts and less so from the outer parts. If you were to then see what the contribution of substructures in the Milky Way is, well, then you can actually start putting in all of the resolved subhalos in the, these uh, simulations. The smallest subhalos that the resolve are of the uh, mass of around 10 to the 5 solar masses or so. And then if you sort of put them on the sky and then work out what their total abundance is and the, you know, work out the internal structures and measure this row squared term, this is what you get as a contribution of these substructures. We still see that, you know, the dominant emission would come from the, uh, the smooth component itself. However, we think that if the dark matter is something like a 100 GeV WIMP, 
the smallest substructures that we'd expect to find in the Milky Way are much, much, much smaller than 10 to the 5. In fact, they should be all the way down to objects of the mass of 10 to the minus 6. And of course, the lower in mass you go, the more objects you get in a cold dark matter cosmology. So the bottom left shows the expected contribution to the annihilation signal in the Milky Way from substructures. If you were to extrapolate this map all the way down to 10 to the minus six solar masses, assuming that you know, the mass function of substructures can be rescaled and that the internal density structure can also be rescaled based on NFW profiles and you know, our known measurements of what the densities of these objects are at these massive scales. And so if you were to then work out what the total annihilation luminosity is, putting in the smooth component and the substructure elements, you find that, in fact, the annihilation luminosity, at least in certain parts of the halo, may be dominated by these extremely low mass halos. But the key point here is that exactly how much they dominate or whether they dominate at all depends on what you assume for their internal density and their abundance when extrapolating over 12 orders of magnitude which can always be something of a risky endeavor. So how do people actually extrapolate? What do they extrapolate on the basis of? So the best attempts at doing this, um, at least recently, have come from Angulo et al. in 2017. Um, and the way this proceeds is as follows. So if you want to actually simulate these very low mass uh, dark matter halos, which have masses of around 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 5 solar masses or so, you clearly need a very sim uh, special simulation setup. You can't just do a traditional cosmological simulation because you need particle masses that are something like 12 or 15 orders of magnitude smaller than anything that people traditionally try. So the way that people have gone about doing this is by not simulating massive cosmological volumes, but rather saving the computational cost by simulating a small box, which allows you to have much higher mass resolution. So in this work by Angulo et al, they start off with a simulation volume with a size of only 22 kiloparsecs, which is in stark contrast to typical cosmological simulations, which are several hundreds of megaparsecs in size. They then run the simulation forward from the initial conditions to a redshift of 30. And then you choose a particular patch of interest as shown with the square where you take these particles again, move them back to the initial conditions, and you just add even more particles to this region to bump up the resolution here. So this high resolution subbox is now a size of around one and a half kiloparsecs. You then evolve this simulation forwards again, up to redshift 30, and what you can start doing is you can start resolving nonlinear structures like dark matter halos, which are now small enough that they would actually comprise these Earth mass objects. But the key point here is that simulations of this type have to be stopped at very high redshift, something like a redshift of 30 or so. Because what happens is that the nonlinear scale in the power spectrum at this time actually becomes of a size that is comparable to the size of the simulation box, which means that your initial conditions no longer actually become appropriate to evolve the simulation further because you miss all of the large scale tidal field effects that you are not simulating by just using this very, very small simulation box. So what these authors find from doing this calculation is something quite dramatic. So here I'm showing um, six different examples of halos extracted from these simulations, where you look at the density profile as a function of radius, and the different colors are essentially the evolution of this density profile over time. And the startling conclusion that these authors and other authors in the past have come to is that one of the fundamental tenets that we thought was always true about cold dark matter halos, um, that you know, they have these three sloped NFW-like shapes and they're all universal in nature and so on, apparently no longer remains true for these Earth mass you know, early generations of dark matter halos. In fact, if you were to just look at what the density profiles of these objects look like, they can be described just by a single power law with a slope of around minus 1.5 or so, rather than this minus 1, minus 2, minus 3 behavior expected from NFWs. Now, this is quite profound because if you were to then extrapolate this uh, scenario here all the way to redshift 0, then this will make quite a sizable difference over what you think the actual annihilation luminosity is because the annihilation luminosity goes as density squared. So whether you're squaring a profile that looks like minus 1.5 or minus 2 or minus 3 actually makes a difference. 
and you know whether or not it actually makes sense to do calculations in the guise of what an NFW profile looks like if your profiles are not NFW itself becomes a you know, philosophical inconsistency. So the question we are interested in to ask is, is it actually appropriate to extrapolate these simulations using these very, very specialized, unique setups all the way to retro zero? So a complete and thorough investigation of this kind is actually very challenging because it really pushes numerical simulations into a totally uncharted regime because we are interested in obtaining the properties of these dark matter halos at the present day but at the same time, we want to actually resolve the large scale environment that these objects should be embedded in because the only way by which we can run simulations of these low mass objects to reach of zero is by making sure we actually have the large scale tidal fields that would allow us to do the simulations accurately. So how do we actually um, you know, maintain both the high resolution needed as well as the large volumes needed for doing a calculation like this? Well, what we do is something called a sequence of zoom simulations, which is kind of shown with this um, rather, uh, well, egregious example shown uh, over here. So imagine we started off with a simulation box of a size of around 740 megaparsecs. This is comparable to the size of the famous Millennium simulation. And we start off with some coarse um, resolution of whatever familiar type that we're used to. What we then do is we select a particular region of interest, say as marked out by this rectangle in the middle. And we say that, okay, this is the region where we want to add more resolution. So we will increase the number of particles here and we will coarsify the resolution exterior to this point. So what this does is that we can still sample the same total mass in the box, have the same total tidal field, we just have better resolution in some parts of the box than in the others. So you would actually focus on the properties within the rectangle now rather than the stuff exterior to it. And if you then do the simulation forward, what the simulation would look like is something like this, where the zoom simulation technique allows you to gain resolution and resolve the structures of interest in the patch that you have chosen while still maintaining the large scale tidal field. The difference is you can't just do this once because the dynamic range is too large. So you have to do this several times over. So this technique is known as the nested zoom technique where you basically do sequences of selecting patches inside the simulation box and add resolution where you want to, coarsify resolution where you don't, but you still maintain the overall large scale tidal field throughout all levels. So what does this look like in the calculation that uh, we performed? So imagine we have started again with a 740 megaparsec simulation. The characteristic length scale here is 150 megaparsecs. Now we chose a region which is marked out by the circle here. We add all our resolution there and degrade the resolution outside. And what the subsequent simulation looks like is something like this. The characteristic length scale here now is 15 megaparsecs, but this is still embedded in the same 740 megaparsec volume. We now choose another patch and re-simulate that with higher resolution. The characteristic length scale in this zoomed level is now a one megaparsec, but it's still embedded in the 740 megaparsec volume. Choose another region, re-simulate it again. Choose another region, re-simulate it again choose another region and you re-simulate it again and you get to what we call level five now, where the characteristic length scale is five kiloparsecs, again, still embedded in the 740 megaparsec volume. And we continue this process over and over till we get to what we call level eight, where now the characteristic length scale is 25 parsecs embedded in a 740 megaparsec volume. So in this tiny patch here, the halos that you actually see in this dark matter projection are actually these earth mass halos for the first time ever now resolved at redshift zero in their appropriate tidal environment. Okay, so now that we have able to sort of visualize this in terms of pictures, you can put some numbers into it to kind of uh, drive home the awe that uh, you should all be experiencing now. So by the time you get to level two in our simulation, the mass resolution of the simulations are already of the order of a thousand solar masses, which is already competitive with some of the highest resolution simulations that have ever been run. And by the time you get to level eight, 
the mass resolution of the highest dark matter, the highest resolution dark matter particles is 10 to the minus 11 solar masses embedded in a 740 megaparsec volume where the total mass density is around 10 to the 19 solar masses. So by the time we reach level eight, you, we actually span 30 orders of magnitude in dynamic range, which is really quite a startling, um, well, numerical feat, if nothing else. So what do we actually learn from this process? Well, we can actually do this calculation of what the internal density structure of these lowest mass dark matter halos looks like at redshift zero. So this diagram shows the logarithmic slope of the dark matter density profile on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is radius in units of the typical scale radius of these halos, so that halos of different mass all fall on the same curves. And each of the different colors is basically showing you characteristic halos from each of the different levels that we've run. So the red line is from level zero, which are cluster mass halos of 10 to the 14 solar masses. And so here you see that, you know, these objects as expected have this slope variation going from minus one to minus three as expected in NFW. But what's startling to notice is that as you go lower and lower and lower in halo mass, all the way to level eight, where we reach 10 to the minus six solar masses and mass, these earth mass halos, in fact, we find that even these objects have these three pronged slopes of minus one, minus two, minus three, and not single power laws as people have predicted um, or in the past using those simplified, or not simplified, but rather specialized setups. So the bottom panels here are showing residuals between the measured profile and analytic profiles like the NFW profile um, and a variation of the NFW, something called the Anastra profile. And in fact, you find that the quality of the agreement is pretty good um, across all mass ranges. So contrary to the conclusions of previous, work, previous works, this three-sloped nature of density profiles remains equally good, even at the most extreme mass scales. And therefore this idea that halo profiles are universal and self-similar is true all the way down. So that, now that that is true, what this allows us to do um, is actually compute some uh, other quantities of interest uh, one in particular being the so-called concentration of dark matter halos. So what concentration is, is basically the following. So imagine you've identified some dark matter halo in your simulation. You identify what the boundary of this halo is based on its real radius. You can compute the density profile as a function of radius um, for this object in some spherical shells, and that's shown in these symbols. And then you take some analytic profile like the NFW and you fit it to the measured profile. And the NFW has a fitting parameter RS, which is called the scale radius. And so the concentration is simply the ratio between the virial radius of the halo and the scale radius, which comes from fitting the NFW. The important thing is that concentration is a measure of the central density of the halo and is also a proxy for the formation time of dark matter halos. In particular, Dark matter halos at fixed mass, which have higher concentrations, are objects that have formed earlier in cosmic history. So what we can do now is actually build this thing called the concentration mass relation, now spanning uh, something like 22 orders of magnitude for the very first time at redshift zero by stitching together the results of different levels. So previous measurements of the concentration mass relation have essentially stopped in the scale of 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 7 solar masses and so, but now with this nested zoom technique, you can actually see what this relation looks like going all the way to the lowest mass objects. And one of the fundamental things that you find is that the concentrations of objects don't just continue to increase going to smaller and smaller masses, but in fact it flattens out and drops over. So what this means is that it isn't the case that a 10 to the five solar mass halo is forming much later than a 10 to the minus five solar mass halo. But because we're seeing that the concentrations are actually pretty similar, it means that these two types of halos, which are different in mass by about 10 orders of magnitude, are actually collapsing at roughly the same time, which is really quite a profound thing. And it's also saying that because the concentrations for these really low mass objects is not that high, it means that their central density is not going to be extremely high or much higher than what we get for typical objects either. 
So this dash curve is just a prediction of a model that some collaborators of mine and I developed a while ago. But the important thing to notice is that previous estimates of the mass and concentration relation typically measure this quantity down to about 10 to the nine or 10 to the eight or so, fit a power law and then extrapolate this over 12 you know, or 15 orders of magnitude to estimate things like the annihilation signal. So this red line is showing what such an extrapolation might look like. And you see that clearly this extrapolation is far exceeding what the actual measured values are from our simulations. So what effect does this actually have for what you estimate to be the annihilation luminosity due to the lowest mass uh, structures that are expected to form in a cold dark matter universe? So this is the final result I'm going to be showing. So this diagram shows the annihilation luminosity contributed by dark matter halos of different masses on the x-axis. These uh, colored solid lines are the measurements from the different levels of our re-simulation strategy. And the dashed lines are predictions of what this annihilation contribution should be based on models for the mass concentration relation that other authors have built based on either some physical arguments or on the basis of extrapolations. And you see that in some of the extreme cases like this dashed yellow curve from Neto et al, uh, which was one of the curves used to actually make the predictions for the annihilation signal in the Springle paper that we looked at the images for in the Aquarius simulations, these predictions are way, way, way off um, compared to what we're actually measuring from our simulations. Um, because this extrapolation over you know, 20 orders of magnitude turns out not to be a very good idea. In particular, what we find is that dark matter halos across the entire mass range of structures in a cold dark matter cosmology contribute about equally to the mean annihilation luminosity at redshift zero. And the new prediction that we're finding from this exercise is that this prediction is actually lower than the ones made by uh, people previously by factors of tens to thousands in the worst case. So this doesn't tell you anything at the moment about substructures, but if you think that these halos are ultimately what become substructures of the Milky Way, then the expected boost you would get to the total annihilation signal within the galactic halo due to low mass substructures would be significantly reduced compared to um, the kinds of boosts um, predicted by uh, you know, previous generations of work in this regime. So to uh, finish off here, I will leave you with my conclusions. Um, so we started off in this regime of um, dark matter halos between 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 10 uh, solar masses, which are these uh, ultra-faint uh, dwarf galaxies. So these are interesting because they maintain a fossil record for galaxy formation in the early universe, uh, because they tell you something about the nature of reionization and the galaxy halo connection. But we spoke about how they actually connect with the assembly history of much larger galaxies like that of the Milky Way. And in particular, we found that earlier forming host galaxies tend to contain more ultrafaints within them, the majority of which are concentrated pretty centrally within the galactic halo itself. And one of the uh, more interesting aspects of that analysis showed that galaxies like the Milky Way are actually rather rare in a lambda CDM cosmology, only around 3% exhibiting the kinds of accretion events that we think uh, punctuated the history of our own galaxy. Shifting uh, further down in the mass scale to somewhere between 10 to 6 and 10 to the 8, we saw this is where dark matter halos are no longer lit up, but this is a particularly interesting regime for testing theories of dark matter. And probes like strong lensing or gaps in streams turn out to be really quite useful because they are, give us ways to actually directly probe the mass function of dark matter halos um, without having to worry about what's happening to the galaxies within them or whether they have galaxies in them or not. And I think these are the kinds of probes that are probably our best bet for setting syndrome constraints on the nature of the dark matter. But one of the questions we have to wonder is, well, if we see something like a perturbation in a lens or a gap in a stream or so on and so forth, does that mean that it is truly due to an interaction with the dark matter halo or could it be due to something else? And that's the kind of uh, question that I think will keep many people working in this particular uh, field um, interest for quite a while. And finally, we focused on the most extreme uh, limit of uh, structure formation, where even smaller dark matter halos, those that are much, much smaller than 10 to the 6, so nowhere near where galaxy formation should occur, um, these objects may be inferred through the contribution to the total annihilation luminosity in the galaxy. 
And using a brand new simulation strategy, which uh, basically relies on many sequences of these things called zoom simulations, we have been able to, for the very first time, resolve structure formation to the very, very limits of the cold dark matter model at redshift zero. And we found that this universality of halo structure is actually truly maintained. But one of the conclusions that we've come to is that the density of these smallest halos are far, far lower uh, than what has been estimated previously, uh, which means therefore that their total contribution to things like the annihilation signal in the galaxy would be much lower than estimated previously as well. And so this is roughly uh, where I want to stop. Uh, uh, so uh, thank you for uh, listening and um, I'd be happy to take your questions if there are any. Uh Okay, Sona, thank you for the great talk and really breathtaking dynamical range. Uh, so we are out of time. It's uh, one minute after noon. And, uh, but let's uh, ask a couple of quick questions. Uh, does anyone have questions? You can either speak up or indicate that you have one in the uh, participant list. So uh, Paul Molson here. Just a, a very simple question. Um, mm -hmm. The suppression at the low mass end, I presume that's just because of suppression of the fluctuations. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's right. So it, it, it kind of depends on exactly what the physics of the dark matter is. So in the case of, um, so are we talking about the uh, tests of dark matter at this is? Yes, yeah, so I, was, I was really, actually your profiles and the late collapse that you mentioned towards the end. Yeah, that's right. So, so this is all due to free streaming, essentially. So in the case of uh, warm dark matter, for example, the free streaming motions, because these particles were relativistic earlier on, are large enough that you get the smoothing out of structure and the suppression on relatively massive scales, like the scale of dwarf galaxies, which is why that is the region of interest when constraining the dark matter. But the, region, the reason why you get the suppression of the concentrations of these low mass dark mass halos is for the same physical reason, which is the free streaming, except that it just manifests on much, much smaller scales um, than it does in warm dark matter. So typically you don't really care about this effect in simulations because you just would never resolve it. But in the regime that we're interested in, in this very small uh, structures, that actually becomes a sizable effect. Thanks. Are there any more questions? Is it possible to test the zoom technique by uh, actually simulating at the scale of the next level for the whole, the whole universe? Or is that just computationally impossible? Um, there, there are limits to it that is uh, possible. So one of the things that we had to be very careful about in doing this is in making sure that when we subsequently zoom, um, we don't actually uh, incorrectly model the scales where we are not uh, putting the high resolution in anymore, i.e. these sort of coarsified levels. So one of the benefits of zooming within the same simulation is that you can always compare the results of the previous simulation with the results of uh, the present um, uh, simulation. So you can compare, say, the results of level one with level two and so on and so forth. So because there are overlapping regions in both, you can always compare, say, the uh, visualizations of the density field or the structure of the density field to see whether you have actually broken the simulation or not and whether things are actually converging. And that's something that has to be really carefully done and relies on very sophisticated uh, building of initial conditions, but also very sophisticated treatment of how um, the simulation code is operating. So we actually spent um, many years, uh, to be <laughs> to be honest, uh, in actually getting these things to work correctly. But these are the kinds of tests that one absolutely has to do. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, are there any more questions? If not, let's thanks Snow again, and uh, thank, you thank you very much, and uh, have a great rest of the day. Cheers. Bye bye, everyone. Bye.